200 years ago, this very month, a short story was published that would change popular culture forever. A short story was published that would introduce us to a very particular type of monster that still seems to fascinate us to this day. 200 years ago, this very month, saw the publication of John Polidori's The Vampire. It goes without saying that anyone with even a passing interest in gothic literature, gothic horror, is very familiar with vampires, vampire fiction, all sorts of things. But a lot of what we uh, take for granted as being part of the vampire mythos and part, that part of the vampire lore actually comes from a much earlier text than uh, we would probably assume. A lot of people assume that we uh, take vampires from Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is of course an incredibly, incredibly important gothic text and changed the way that we see the vampire mythos introduced us to the Eastern European ideal and all of these things. But actually, John Polidori's 20 odd page book, um, or I should say 20 odd page story, was a much earlier and much more influential um, story to what we now know as the vampire mythos than we would think. Now John Polidori was Byron's personal physician, yeah, that Lord Byron. Poet, raconteur, libertine, all of the above. And John Polidori was actually there with Byron at the Villa Diodati on that fateful and almost mythical now ghost story competition. It was the year without the summer. There'd been a catastrophic, huge volcanic eruption that changed the global climate for the next decade. And so to try and escape this, Byron and his personal physician, John William Polidori, sought out Switzerland in the hopes that maybe they'd find nature and beauty and be able to relax on the continent with, I guess, thoughts of lovely mountain treks through the Alps and all sorts of things. That didn't happen. Switzerland's climate was just as bad as England's climate. But it is there, at the Villa Diodati, that they were joined by Percy by Shelley, his wife, Mary Godwin, their three-year-old son, and Mary Godwin's half-sister, stepsister, Claire Clem, who, by the way, was pregnant with Byron's child at the time. While they were there, they started to tell ghost stories to each other. They read German folk tales. One particular text that they read was a translation of Phantasmagoria. And I guess in keeping with the atmosphere that they created, decided that they were gonna hold a ghostwriting competition. Now, Polidori's original entry for this competition was less than well received by his fellow ghostwriters. Um, Mary Shelley basically laughed at it while she herself eventually wrote what would become Frankenstein published the year before Polidori's story was published. But Byron kind of started this story based on some old folk tales, also Coleridge's Christabel, various um, poems and folk stories and things like that that had gone before. Um, and eventually Polidori, at a much later date, would pick this up, rewrite it, give his own spin, and it would become The Vampire. The vampire follows a young Englishman called Aubrey, who is a very romantic idealist, loves poetry and all of those things. And at a society event, he meets Lord Ruven. Now, Lord Ruven is Polidori's only partially hidden attempt at doing a satirical portrait of his, by this time, ex-employer. Byron. Riven, Lord Riven, is the name that Byron's lover, Lady Mary Lamb, gave her 
scheming hero in her poem that was based on Byron. So Polidori called him Riven to be like, hey, this is Byron. Um, and what's really interesting is that while it, it becomes very, very clear that Riven is a vampire, he is not the vampire necessarily that we would recognise. Lord Riven is very charismatic and suave, and this was the first time that a vampire appeared in prose fiction. This is the first time that a vampire was more than a poor, cursed, plagued peasant. This was the first time that a vampire was more than a reanimated corpse. Lord Riven had agency. He was able to make his own decisions. He was able to seek out his own victims. And this was big. Interestingly, when it was first published, the vampire was actually attributed to Byron, which is something that both Byron and Polidori really did their best to try and fix. Byron was offended that what he saw as inferior, but actually was a lot better received than any of his other poetry, was attributed to him when it was an in, uh, meant to be semi-insulting. Polidori was obviously mortified that his former employer, because by this time the two had a massive falling out and were barely on speaking terms, got the credit for his work. Eventually it was fixed and it was attributed to the correct person but throughout the rest of the 19th century it would be published as a Byron story. In the story, so Aubrey has met Lord Rhythm, he is entranced and sort of seduced, not necessarily sexually though obviously there is a massive homoerotic undertone. He is convinced to go on the grand tour with Riven and so they go and they want to you know visit all of the ancient ruins and all of those kinds of things and they end up in Greece and in Greece Aubrey meets a young girl called Ianthe, falls in love with her, decides that he doesn't want anything to do with Riven anymore. Now the thing about Lord Riven is he, he leaves rich well-to-do women completely ruined, destroyed, financially, socially, morally, ruins them. He also gives money to undeserving people or the most deserving people um, but it's kind of cursed money because they will ruin themselves using this money so he's a very moralistically grey character. He's not a wonderful person. Um, and while he's with Ianthe and her Greek family they warn him that there is a vampire Aubrey obviously doesn't believe that there is a vampire. Um, he believes that he's free from Lord Ruven's influence and everything's fine. Unfortunately, things take a tragic turn and Aubrey finds himself at the mercy of Lord Ruven and Ruven's vengeance. I won't go into too much detail about that because I'd really like you to read the story and find out for yourself. Like I said, it's only just over 20 pages, I think it's 24 pages long, so it shouldn't take too long, but it is well worth the read. It's not the best written text. You gotta remember, Polidori was a physician, he was a doctor, he wasn't a writer, he wasn't a poet like those in his circle. He wasn't like Byron, the Shelleys, um, Keats, Coleridge, all of these people. He was a physician that tried his hand at something, so it's not the most expertly written of books. But it obviously has this lasting legacy. So when we think of vampires in the modern world, we think of these suave, sophisticated, aristocratic characters. That's all Lord Riven. That is Lord Riven's influence on the modern world and modern popular culture. Before this, the only other time there'd really been vampires in literature were in poems. And they tended to be females, they tended to be semi-magical creatures. So you had Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, you had La Belle Dame Sans Merci by Keats. These are all deadly female characters. 
Any other vampires would come from folklore, and a lot of the folklore does come from Greece, it does come from Eastern Europe, but there is vampire folklore of a kind in every culture around the world. But these vampires were always corpses that were reanimated, or they were cursed, or they were plagued, they were victims, they were mindless zombies, they didn't have agency, they didn't have any real logic to what they did, they just fed on the living. So suddenly to have this aristocratic person with his own agency, with his own means of getting around and, and projecting himself in society, this is a big deal. Suddenly we have this male, seductive, rich figure entering the world of the vampire mythos. The first prose vampire was Lord Riven. He was an aristocrat. He wasn't just a monster. And something that's really interesting to note about Polidori's vampire is that he is very much human. He's not described as being necessarily monstrous in appearance or manner at all. The only thing that, that Aubrey says when he describes seeing Riven for the first time is there doesn't really seem to be much feeling or much character or much emotion behind his eyes. But that doesn't necessarily make him any different from a Byronic type figure who is just cool, calm and collected and kind of dismissive of all the women. That was a normal thing. He was just a rakish, libertinish sort of character. This morally ambiguous person who kind of liked to play hard to get, I guess. And it's not until a lot later, when Stoker wrote Dracula, that we get these ideas of vampires with fangs and claws and hairy palms and all of those kinds of things and you've got to stake it and everything because actually we don't find out in the vampire how to deal with the vampire because spoiler alert but Riven gets away they don't get Riven Lord Riven escapes he lives to kill another person unlike in Dracula where we're very much told this is how you deal with the vampire this is how you defeat the vampire so I think it's really, really important to, to celebrate the influence that Polidori's The Vampire has had on Gothic literature, Gothic culture, and the romanticization of the vampire as a creature. Without Lord Riven, we wouldn't have this vampire that could walk about in society. In fact, actually, Bram Stoker's Dracula couldn't walk about in polite society. He climbed down walls like lizards. He looked hideous. When he arrives in London, he's wearing the wrong clothes. He looks silly. He's kind of a bit of a pariah. Whereas Riven walks around in society. I was lucky enough to get a ticket to yesterday go to the British Library with a talk by um, two academics, Emma McAvoy and Nick Groom and the novelist Kim Newman who wrote the Anno Dracula series um, of I guess alternate history reimaginings and they talked about the fact that a lot of the films, most of the films that have Dracula as this suave character, they take their Dracula from Bram Stoker's Dracula but more... more... It, <sighs> They actually take their inspiration from Bela Lugosi's portrayal of Dracula, who incidentally, he wasn't monstrous. He didn't even have fangs. The only thing, the only effect or, or anything that they, they put on him to make him seem inhuman was shining light in his face so he had this otherworldly ethereal glow to his eyes. He didn't have fangs. He was a well-dressed, suave gentleman. And all of these things in Dracula films, where he is presented in society, he appears in a soiree, that comes from Lord Riven. Bram Stoker's Dracula in his book, he wasn't going to be able to present himself in polite society, but Lord Riven can. Polidori's The Vampire is um, available in a lot of collections with other gothic stories from a similar era, and I would really, really recommend you track it down and give it a read because it's really really interesting but more than that it's a really really important slice of gothic literature that's had a lasting effect on the way that we view the vampire to this day.
Thank you very, very much for watching, and I hope to see you soon.